to the 76th ever episode of the Missouri Sports Podcast, brought to you by 106 Apparel and recording from the Revel Advertising Studio in beautiful Springfield, Missouri. I'm one of your hosts, Cameron Albert, alongside my good friend and fellow Mizzou fan, Kyle DeVries. How are you doing today, Kyle? I'm great, Cameron. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, although I just lied to you, to Cameron, to the whole world, and said that it's beautiful in Springfield, Missouri, when in fact it's very cold and not not beautiful at all here in the dead of winter yeah pretty sure this feels like the coldest day of like the whole year maybe or a whole winter so far i it's We've probably a mild winter yeah we have it's probably only what like 20 degrees but it feels so much colder than that because it's the wind it's like that kind of wind that just like cuts through your clothes and like burns your skin makes you want to die yeah but other than that it's beautiful yeah, yeah there it was sunny still exist that like winter better than summer i'll never mm. understand it I never, never walk out on a mm. nice summer day and hurt. Those people are out there. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where. Uh, Kyle, we've got a lot to talk about today. We have a basketball team that I don't know what to do with because they lose games like they did last week and then they are competitive like they were this week and it's, it's befuddling. Yep, I don't know either, so that'll be the end of the podcast. Yep, uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs> but we have news to talk about. I accidentally Whoa. hit it twice, but <laughs> there we go. That that was now, amazing. That's how you introduce the news <laughs> segment right there. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that legitimately little. frightened me. <laughs> Yeah, it was louder than I meant it to be. But Producer Cameron had something up his sleeve. We didn't know what, and I <laughs> forgot about it. I forgot that something was coming, and then boom. Wow. That was exciting. Yes. Thanks, Producer Cameron. Um, <laughs> before we get to the news, though, did you watch, did you watch, <laughs> yeah. any, of the, uh, did you watch any of the St. Louis Battle Hawks? Uh, I actually did. I, I, I'm not going to lie uh, when I say that I, I don't really care that much, like, it's just like yeah you don't care much about the xfl i mean it's like football cool um it's good to see some guys that maybe you watched in college or whatever there's some former mizzou players getting in on the action but can't say it really like amps me up or anything but um it's cool and i i watched most of the battle hawks game and solid damian washington and marcus lucas getting in on the action as well making some catches and so that was that was cool yeah i checked the box score afterwards when it wasn't able to watch it live i watched actually more of the one o'clock game it was, I think, New York, Seattle, or something like that. Sounds right. Uh, they kind of hype, been hyping up the league as like more offense and more scoring. But if you just look at the scores, looks like I think every single game uh, hit the under. Yeah. Um, so is that the proper term? Hit the under? Probably not. You understood what I meant? Yeah. The under hit. Hard. Yeah, I guess it, yeah, it, <laughs> it did. So it was lower scoring than everyone expected, and I don't know if that's just because. The offenses were bad or or what but um it, it definitely brought some different cool elements to the game like random interviews like mid game i loved the the comms mm -hmm. the all the communications hearing the coach call the play in hearing the refs talk to talk to each other hearing the refs talk to the review yeah. booth and all that was interesting i don't know who like the on-field reporter is during most of the games but the for the battle hawks game it was pat mcafee so that was really oh, wow. entertaining yeah, yeah he did a really I, good job i wish i had watched that now i'll have to pay attention next week yeah but i also kind of like that they just put like the betting lines on the screen and stuff yes. like just like the over under just and embrace it yeah it, I, I agree and it makes it's just entertaining even when you're not when even when you don't have money on the line it's still just kind of interesting to watch for entertainment purposes and mm -hmm. the the announcers were like just blatantly talking about it and stuff so i thought that was cool we were talking about before we um, pressed record um, with Damian Washington, his like 15 minutes of fame where he appeared on an episode of The Office in name only. And I don't think it was intentional, but uh, there's an episode where they're doing a trivia night or something. And there's a table of like uh, Jim and some other guys who know about sports and the question was who was the NBA six man of the year in like 2008 or something like that. And you can tell they know their sports cause they do guess a legitimate 
six man just the wrong year and i think like kelly kapoor's table gets it right because she remembered them talking about it on keeping up with the kardashians so it's lamar odom Mm -hmm. but um who's the who's the uh, ryan ryan yeah he takes a stab at it and just is like spitballing a name that sounds like a nba player and he says the damian washington Mm -hmm. yeah it's I, I definitely think it was completely unintentional, obviously, but I think I've seen LaDamian like point it out on Twitter before yeah. and stuff, how he was like unintentionally famous. And uh, that's pretty cool. I, I remember hearing it on The Office when I was watching the show and I was like, whoa, what? Yeah, like, I know that guy. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, kind of funny. Anyway, we he's, actually, yeah, he's go going to be one of the older players on the Battlehawks team, I would think. Maybe. I was wondering about that, but I feel like he's one of their priority receivers though he seemed like to get one or two reps um wide receiver reps so yeah they have they spread the ball around quite a bit in that first game i think like seven guys had a had a reception Mm -hmm. i think uh dallas i think is who they played Mm -hmm. that was like a nine and a half point favorite yeah so uh, and well their quarterback got hurt oh Larry jones was supposed to be their starter oh really he was terrible in the nfl um (laughs) Maybe that's probably why he's playing the XFL. Um, well, they were the, like the favorites to win the Super Bowl, like obviously before the season that like Vegas put the money on on Dallas to win not the Super Bowl. The Whatever Dallas, the, the Dallas Roughnecks were supposed to win the Super Bowl, the Super Bowl of XFL, oh, whatever oh, that okay. is. The uh, I don't know what they call it. I don't know either. The championship. The cha- <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Man, that's a weird name. For that. Uh, should we move on to the news now? Absolutely. This just in, Brian Walters could be considered for the Colorado head coaching job. What do you think about that, Kyle? Uh, That'd be unfortunate uh, if he were to leave, especially at this point in the season, I think. At this point, it's like kind of late in the game, and everybody's kind of like, this is where I'm going to be for the next year. So um, that would be bizarre if he left, and I think it would be difficult finding a strong candidate to replace him at this point. Well, this is what happens when a school like – Michigan State has a coaching change this late in the coaching carousel process and is a big time destination for a potential coach. Yeah. Um, now, what adds a, I don't know, have you been keeping up with this story at all with the former Colorado coach? I guess he, uh, he had already, uh, ru- there's a lot of rumors and speculation going to, into this, but a lot of people seemed to think that he had accepted the offer from Michigan State and then still attended a uh, booster dinner at Colorado and, you know, just kind of went on with business as usual and then shortly after was like, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm going to Michigan State. Oh, really? He had also vocally complained about player transfers and – That'll come back to bite you yes. in this. Uh, yeah, just never Twitter age. Yes. Just yeah. never comment on player transfers. I have just seen like a wave of all the no- all the usual suspects, which I agree with them. They're right, but it's all all the normal people that come out and say something on the subject have. Yeah, and that it's unfair for students to be uh, criticized for wanting to make changes um, when the coaches can do it with no, literally no penalty at all, and in fact usually get raises. So, and I saw somebody saying that you know questioning. Uh, questioning the outrage i guess um that might be a little bit of a strong term but questioning that you know this guy should be allowed to do this and yeah absolutely he should be allowed to it it doesn't matter he should be able to go get a better job whenever he wants but it's super hypocritical of him to talk bad about player transfers and say that it's bad for the game Mm -hmm. when you're going to go leave your team and take another position you know in february yeah at this point it's I don't know. You're just kind of the grumpy old man if you're like upset about like players transferring because just I'm sorry that players have lives and they're making really, really important decisions at an incredibly young age. And a lot of times there can be bad influences in their life that maybe point them to a school that might not be in their best interest. And like, who knows? There could be a million different things going on behind the scenes. But ultimately, it's incredibly common for players to go somewhere they probably they could have probably made a better decision and it's just unfair to hold them 
so accountable and like give them so many penalties and everything whenever they just want to try to make a better decision for themselves and I just I don't know it seems weird to come out and criticize them for yeah. just young people that are trying to better their lives and as a coach are you gonna then refuse all transfers into your program right exactly so as a as a coach you'd think that they'd be smarter to publicly make a a complaint about yeah. something like that when they're working with students so much and they probably there is some emotions for them i mean they, they're not just robots but sure you know maybe bounce those ideas off your staff or something before you take to twitter or uh, hire a pr person or yeah. something <laughs> or uh, consult them before you take to twitter you can be bummed about a transfer or even you know frustrated and mad about it but let's just keep that internal. Yeah, don't make these like general blanket statements about the entire like culture of transferring. But uh, Ryan Walters, he did play at Colorado. He was a captain there, uh, graduated from there. Uh, so he, his name has come up. Um, former Missouri Tiger Alex Grinch, who was the defensive coordinator at Oklahoma, his name has come up. I saw his name come up also for the Washington State job mm -hmm. when Mike Leach left a while back. Um, another name that was interesting, uh, could be interesting to Mizzou fans, is Chiefs offensive coordinator. Mm -hmm. Eric Bieniemy. Yes. He also played at Colorado or something. He has a, he has ties to there. Yeah. Um, I just can't imagine stepping into a head coaching position at this this late in the off season. Yeah. Like after I mean, signing day, yeah. it would be like really, really tough. It's already tough for the normal cycle when those coaches have like two months before right. the February signing day. So it would be a massive disadvantage. You'd almost have to just like completely write off that first year is just like, I mean, you, a lot of people, you almost do that anyway when you have a coaching true, change true. and that's just like, you know, you're just stepping into the most difficult situation imaginable. Yeah. Uh, as far as Ryan Walters, I mean, that would obviously be a great career move for him. You would think uh, to go from a, a DC at a you know power five school to a head coach of a power five school especially one that you played at um, and probably have a lot of passion for um, you know we've seen at least Mizzou has seen hires of you know play uh, former players and stuff and it hasn't gone all that great especially ones with no head coaching experience yes in, in, in recent history that yes that hasn't gone super well um, but you never know and that would that'd be a great career move for him personally probably um, and I don't, I don't know. know how much interest there is on the Colorado side. This is just his, his name has been thrown out there just because of the connection. Right. And honestly, they're going to be a little bit desperate at this stage in the game. Exactly. Yeah. The coaching uh, options have been picked through quite thoroughly at this point. Right. And as far as Eric the enemy goes, I know there's been an incredible amount of talk about him being deserving of an NFL head coaching job. I guess he interviewed at se with several different teams and, I, you know, a lot of people think that he's, he's definitely credible enough and worthy enough of, the, of getting that position. And especially when there's two head coaches in the NFL right now that were recently in that same position as offensive coordinator for the chiefs, you know, uh, their names escape me right now, but Peterson yeah. at, in Philadelphia and, uh, bears head coach, bears head coach, can't remember his name at the top of my head, but, uh, so, you know, it, it seems like that's a guy who would be looking to make the jump to an NFL head coach and there's there's demand obviously f out there so I think that he could stick around in the position he's in right now and get a head coaching job in the NFL the next year or two if that's if that's what he wanted to do and he can say I won a Super Bowl all that stuff so I don't know that I see him going to Colorado and that's just written that's that's just something that he personally really wants to do to be a college head coach um, but that introduces an entire new realm of coaching where you're doing recruiting and all that stuff. And so being a college coach, it's a lot, it's a lot of work. Not that what he's doing now isn't, but it's just different. You're dealing with so much more personnel type mm -hmm. issues than he probably is right now. Yeah. Well, it'll be a situation to keep an eye on, um, for multiple reasons. If you're in the state of Missouri, um let's stick to football for a minute uh christian holmes uh announced that he is joining the oklahoma state cowboys uh so he found a new home and it's in the big 12 another power five program so not really too much of a step down at all for him just going from the sec to the big 12 so yeah and he's going to be a graduate tra transfer so he's going to be eligible immediately 
Um, and who knows? We'll probably. It seems like we play Oklahoma State every two or three years in yeah. a bowl game, so maybe we'll run maybe into next them. year. Will be the year. <laughs> uh, then, last thing for football news: the NFL announced their uh, NFL com- draft combine invitees. Uh, some former Missouri Tigers that are on the list include Kelly Bryant, Tristan Colon Castillo, Yasir Durant, Jordan Elliott, Kale Garrett, and Albert O. Uh, some people we thought maybe would have a chance but didn't make the cut Demarcus Acey, Jonathan Johnson, Trevor Wallace Sims. So, um, anything about either one of those lists that surprises you? Yeah, I, I was going to say I'm a little bit surprised that Kelly Bryant got an invite to the combine. And Wallace Sims didn't. Honestly, I feel like he's a guy that could be successful in the NFL. I mean, he obviously still could be. Um, but this is this is a lot of guys to be invited to the NFL Combine for Mizzou. I, I, so at six, that's probably the upper echelon of the SEC as far as players getting invited to the Combine. I've seen a lot of hype about Jordan Elliott. I think a lot of scouts really like him a lot. And he's he graded out really, really well this year. I mean, I think he was one of the top interior defensive linemen as far as the you know, both pass defense and rush defense mm-hmm. as far as pro football focus grading mm-hmm. out goes. So I, I think he, if he has a strong combine and just interviews well and all that stuff, I really think he, he could be drafted in the second round. I don't, I don't know if he'll get up to the first round level. That would be, that would be fantastic if he could, but I, I really do think he could definitely go in that second round, hopefully no later than the third, but um, I've seen a lot of good stuff about him for sure. And I think in their initial grades, the the combine kind of gives initial grades. I think he was by far the highest of the Mizzou guys initially. I think uh, DeMarcus AC surprises me just a little bit because I don't know, there was a lot of hype surrounding him going into his senior year. And I thought he performed fairly well for the most part. Um, he was definitely not the weak spot on the defense by any means. Mm-hmm. And they, it really showed when he was hurt and not in games how much they missed him so i thought maybe he would get a look um i still think he has a a pretty good shot of maybe being an undrafted free agent you know a training camp guy that can maybe find a spot somewhere so maybe keep an eye out for him when we get a little bit closer to the draft we'll do a some official predictions on who we think will get drafted and where they uh what round they'll get drafted in and i have to make a mental note to like take my projections back <laughs> like one or two rounds for every guy honestly that that's really been the case the last couple of drafts it seems like you know all the way up to the draft we hear really good things on certain mizzou guys and then they end up going like like you said like two rounds later than yeah, we expect like and, fifth and round, even seventh even round. drew Locke, we saw him go like 42nd overall or something whenever i thought he had the potential to go top 10 yeah. going into draft night so you never know what's going to happen, and it seems like recent, at least recently, Mizzou guys have gone a little bit later than ever we than, than we'd like. But um, I agree with you on AC. It seemed like there was a ton of hype coming into his senior year. Sometimes cornerbacks are weird in the in the fact that like the better they play, the less action they see because you know teams will you know throw the opposite side of the field and stuff like that. So I don't know if it's just you know teams kind of try to run plays away from that side of the field or try to throw to other receivers. Um, and maybe he just didn't get his name called a lot or as much as we were used to seeing with him. I don't really know what the case was with him, but I still agree with you that I, he had a pretty solid season for sure. Uh, switching gears to talk about basketball, Mizzou hosted a uh, class of 2021 forward Jaden Jones for the Rally for Ryan game against Arkansas. Jones, he does not have an offer from Mizzou as of right now, but he's a 6'7" forward from st louis uh, number 91 in the rivals top 150 and he is a high school and aau teammate of jordan nesbitt also obviously from st louis who we've talked about on the podcast before um i'm surprised that a scholarship offer wasn't announced um surrounding the visit for either of those guys probably but yeah yeah i mean i don't know obviously they're interested in Jaden Jones, uh, he is a little bit higher ranked according to like the composite of all the different recruiting um, services. So he's he's now the number two player in the state of Missouri uh, for 2021 behind Aminu Muhammad. Obviously, pretty big gulf there between those two, but um, definitely a guy to keep your keep an eye on. I like I said, I'm surprised there hasn't been an offer already. So. 
yeah, that, any day now, I would expect an official announcement that he's been offered a scholarship. That's kind of what I was thinking, especially in a guy. I think I saw that he visited, or I guess he didn't visit, but he watched Mizzou versus Illinois as well. So he's seen yes. two big wins for Mizzou this year. Obviously, a guy they're interested in if he's watched multiple games. I I don't know why they haven't offered uh, when it when they're clearly interested. I don't know. It almost makes you wonder if they're waiting on somebody else. I, I don't really know what's going on. We've tried to crack this puzzle a million times and it's not going to happen so i i like Jaden jones i like his game um like you said like six seven guy who can shoot really well yeah can shoot can stretch the floor um i've watched a decent amount of of video on him and um i don't know like obviously we're watching video of him in high school so there's like an incredible amount of time for him to develop but he looks to me like he kind of plays slow, maybe. Like he just like a lot of the, his movements just look kind of slow to me. But he is a great shooter, and I mean, it, sometimes, at least in high school games, you can have a little more time to get a shot up. But uh, n- another interesting thing about him, whenever I was looking up up on YouTube and stuff like that, was I saw he was one of those kids that was really good, really young. And so, and we're kind of getting to that point where those kids have, are growing up. So he had like a bunch of like fifth grade mixtapes and stuff like that. So, <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, yeah, I feel like I see that stuff all the time. Like, you know, fourth grader or like eight year old so and so is like destroying <laughs> people, and they're like crossing people over and stuff. Well, that was class him. of twenty thirty two. Yeah, Phenom. yeah. It's like holy, cr- like we're we're getting old enough to where we're like seeing those kids actually like pursue their college options now and stuff, which is weird. So it's inter- it's interesting to see like which kids that are like go viral and stuff on youtube and instagram and then a few years later you're like oh they're going not not to disparage anyone in particular but they're going to you know drexel or something <laughs> you're like oh we thought this guy was like gonna go to duke and right. lead him to a national championship when he was in fifth grade yeah it turns out there's a lot more to basketball than like crazy dunks but uh i remember in one in particular that I was just like blown away by this kid was he was a seventh grader at the time, but his name was seventh woods. Mm -hmm. Do you remember him? Yeah. And he was like massively viral. Like I feel like one of the first really young kids that was just like blowing up and he ended up going to North Carolina and I think he's, he might still be there. He he might be gone by now, but he kind of, like you said, you know, didn't really have a huge role. I don't think at North Carolina, but he was on their team. He now attends, South Carolina. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I did not realize that. And he's playing for them this year. No, 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 no. Let me back up. 2018-19. So. He he was at North Carolina at one point, yes, though, right? Okay. I was like, started to he think going crazy. He transferred from North Carolina to South Carolina. Interesting. Averaged two and a half points, one rebound, two assists. But yeah, that's it's always interesting, you know, just how these kids blow up and they'll have a, a mixtape. And obviously it's the job of the Bala's Life or uh, whatever organization is making it to hype them up as much as possible so that they get views on YouTube. But mm-hmm. yep, we're definitely reaching that point where these fifth graders are now choosing colleges and mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, anything else uh, newsworthy before we head into some uh, some game action? That's it. Missouri remains undefeated in Rally for Ryan games, much to the surprise of the Missouri Sports Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> they are now 5-0 and as they beat the Arkansas Razorbacks 83-79 to in overtime. Without... Any help from Mark Smith or Jeremiah Tillman? Yeah, I was pretty surprised by how this went. And they just, I mean, they've done this a hundred different times, it seems like, this season. They're just, like, amazing, and then they're the worst team I've ever watched in my life. And, like, <laughs> just game to game almost. It's, and a lot of it, I feel like, depends on if they're home or away. Um, I feel like we'll talk about it, obviously, but the LSU game felt like the first road game where they've really played inspired all year. Um, they've played well at home for the most part, but I still did not expect him to be Arkansas, even without Isaiah Joe. Um, but you know, sometimes when you've got 12,000 fans or whatever, or 10 to 12,000 fans behind you, you play a little harder, maybe can make a little bit of a difference. Um, I was, I was surprised by this. Um, after last week, when you, 
lose by 20 to South Carolina and you're down by 20 at one point to Texas A&M, it's like, okay, we can't expect a win the rest of the season. Expect a win? No, can't do it the rest of the season. So um, I was actually coaching my younger brother's uh, first and second grade basketball game and the Mizzou game had started and they're, they're really, I talked about taking them to the game against Chicago State. They are huge fans of <laughs> Mizzou basketball right now. And I kind of feel bad. I thought, I think maybe I should have just got them watching Duke or something, just turn them into Duke fans as six and five year olds, just to save them the heartbreak. But, um, <laughs> the older one, Caleb, he got a program at the Mizzou game that we went to and he's been on his own watching the Mizzou games with the program in his hand, looking at who, okay, who's number 12. Okay. That's Drew Smith. Okay, got it. And he memorized the entire roster. They were over at our house, and we I had a game on, and he's like, oh, there's Reed Nico. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like oh, who, do you know everybody that's on the court? And he's like, oh, yeah, he knew them all. And then, he's, and then Kobe Brown subbed in for Mitchell Smith. And he said, well, now, now Kobe Brown's in. Mitchell Smith is on the bench. I was like, what? Was so, he happy about that? Uh, he was unhappy in that particular game that Mark Smith could not make a three-pointer. He specifically said, what's wrong with Mark? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, bud. <laughs> he, he, uh, he's struggling a little bit. Anyway, uh, the first thing they did when, they, when their game was over is they went over to my dad and said, can we go watch the Mizzou game now? And for whatever reason, they were going to have to record it and watch it later. And I said, I'll save you some time. They're going to lose. And then they're like, oh, like next practice after this game, like, oh, what happened? Like you said they were going to lose. And I was like, yeah. I guess I'll predict a loss from now on if they're going to win a couple. Yeah, um, I'm I'm super shocked, honestly. Um, and now that we see, we've seen the next round of games. So we saw Arkansas's next game, and they got destroyed by Tennessee. So maybe Isaiah Joe's is the thing that makes that team tick. I don't know. They did play on the road at Tennessee, but they have not looked very good the last two games. So maybe they're just a team that's that's trending down, and we caught them at the right time. But I don't want to. Uh, diminish what Missouri did in that game either though I'll diminish it a little bit okay uh Arkansas shot pretty terribly and Missouri seems like they're gonna shoot poorly more often than not so when a team says okay we'll short shoot poorly as well then that's gonna give Missouri a chance that changed a little bit in the LSU game but we'll get to that um as far as individual performances go Xavier Pinson had probably the maybe the most impressive individual game of anybody this season he had 24 points two of four from three uh 12 of 13 on free throws he added seven rebounds three assists and just two turnovers and he just many times decided he was just going to go get a bucket or at least get fouled and go to the line and he was still fairly inefficient um, three of 11 from two, but he just kind of decided that he was going to do whatever he had to do to keep Missouri in this game. I, I think it's time. If he hasn't already realized this, it's very much just time for him to realize that he offers something that nobody else does. And it, it seemed like he's starting to maybe realize that the last two games, whenever we need a bucket, I, it just seems like Penson's like, all right, I'm about to put this team on my back mm -hmm. and because nobody can get to the basket like I can. And I still think he is by far the highest ceiling of any player on the roster, and it's probably not close. <clears throat> He's only a, a sophomore. And maybe I'm overreacting from you know the last few games, but I really feel like Conzo just needs to be like, Dave, Xavier, this is like your team going forward. And like you single-handedly like are going to be the driving force on like how we do over the next few years because – it seems like this team goes as you go and like I said you just bring like he, he brings something that nobody else does and whenever he's not getting to the basket and he's not cutting and and, and moving really well like that then nobody's going to do it and uh, Pickett's going to try but he's not going to do it all that well. Penson man there's so many times in the last two games where I was just like audibly was like wow yeah like when he was doing his thing. Yeah, and sometimes he doesn't even have to finish necessarily. I mean, obviously you need him to most of the time, but he will draw multiple defenders to him so that that frees somebody up for the offensive rebound a lot of the time. Um, he's kind of 
stepping up a little bit in the Mark Smith role of a guard that's just going to go get defensive rebounds and try to limit off the the uh, offense's second chances as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was something I was really worried about with Mark Smith missing several games in a row is that Missouri may get just destroyed on the offensive glass. But I think he's helped a lot with that. I still need him to cut down on the turnovers. Yeah, He's shown improvement from last year to this year, but need to see it a little bit more. And then also just in conference play, he's only shooting 30% on two-point field goals. This does seem really simple, but it's amazing what happens when you make shots, though. And I really feel like he's shot better from three the last few games. And I think when he does that, it opens up those lanes that he's been getting to the basket through so well the last few games. Um, yeah, I agree. He's, he has to improve. And if he's especially going to play some point, he's, he's got to, I don't know, kind of step up as far as turnovers go and just leading the team and everything. But um, I really do feel like we've seen some development in him just like understanding how, you know, how teams look at scouting reports and whenever he's making threes i just think you know teams are going to come out on him more and that's oh, he's taking advantage of, of that knowledge now to where he can get to the basket when people are coming out to guard him yeah his turnover rate has gone down a little bit in conference play which is good and his three-point percentage has gone up in conference play uh, despite a 0 for 5 game against lsu um there were three other players who scored in double figures as well. Drew Smith, Javon Pickett, and Reed Nico. And Reed Nico is doing everything he can to have that senior season SEC play Ryan Rosberg experience that we asked for. He's not quite to that level, but he is giving it everything he has. And I don't know, He's he will make those similar plays where it's like just, you know, have soft hands, catch the ball, finish you know, get to the foul line, dunk everything. Yes. You know, get creative with, I remember Rosberg had this knack of just shielding his shot away from a more athletic defender by just reversing it and just like using the rim to kind of protect himself from the block. And I've seen Reed Nico do that a little bit. So I think, I mean, with Tillman being out, you are not going to win many games at all. If you just continue to get nothing, from Reed Nico. So the fact that he can step up, provide double di- double digit scoring and just protect the rim a little bit, that's huge in any wins Missouri's going to have the rest of the season. Didn't he have a double double in one of these games? Yes. Can't remember which one, but <clears throat> he he seriously has been far exceeding expectations and I don't know. He's he's playing his hardest and it's it's so cool just to see where he's come from even the, like the beginning of the season it was just kind of like okay we know what reed is at this point and maybe he can block a few shots or like play some good defense or you know come in whenever tillman's in foul trouble and i don't know he's kind of unlocked that next level in the last few weeks and it's a shame because well i'll mention real quick this was he was at 11 and 11 in this game 11 points 11 rebounds in the arkansas game it's kind of a shame that the rest of the team around him I mean, he's kind of playing to the point where if the rest of the team around him was executing and living up to their potential, he would be perfectly serviceable on a team that could be fighting for even us being able to talk about their resume. You know, I'm not saying that they could be a bubble team with him starting at the five, but if we, we can't even talk about their resume at no, this point. Absolutely it's not. so far gone. But if... If Drew Smith, Penson, Torrance Watson, you know, Mark Smith not being hurt, if those guys were shooting like they did last year and the only difference was Reed was playing these games instead of Tillman, I think we'd still have a solid squad that could be in that conversation with, you know, South Carolina. Yeah, North I would Florida, say Arkansas. there's probably three or four different guys that if they played as well as they did against LSU every game, we w- might have a shot at the tournament. Like, Pickett, Penson, Drew Smith, Reed Nico, and Nico, all played like per, like beyond what we've seen them play at any point in mm-hmm. their like in their Mizzou careers, 
and if uh, I agree, if, if everybody was playing up to expectation, like those guys were, or, or showing any signs of development whatsoever, then yeah, I think we could talk about resume. Um, and the same is probably also true in reverse. If Tillman was the solid, improved player his junior year that we thought he would be, and he was healthy, then that would cover up a lot of this other stuff that's going wrong with the guards and the wings. So it's like, could we get either one? But, I mean, we've talked about it a couple times now that just regression everywhere is not a recipe for very many wins. Mm-mm. Um, one guy I did want to spotlight, though, is Trey Jackson. In the Arkansas game, he had nine points in just 15 minutes. He was four for four uh, from two, including three dunks. So he had one play um, where he had the ball kind of at the top of the key, and nobody decided to stop him. So he decided, <laughs> okay, I'm just going to go dunk it. And yeah. he threw down a monster dunk. Yeah, that was and great. got the crowd going. Um, then he had a huge block on the defensive end and then ran the length of the floor and put back a pence and miss for another dunk. And then he finished uh, an alley-oop kind of press break situation at the very end of the game to pretty much seal it up for Missouri. Mm-hmm. And I kind of find myself like rooting for Trey Jackson, like his, like obviously I'm rooting for all the Missouri players, but like, whenever he does something well i feel like i'm especially happy because he's just another player that i feel like you know he's really young and he hasn't probably played as well or as much as he would have hoped or that we would have hoped this year but a guy that has the potential to have an outstanding career if he you know just sticks around and and keeps playing hard and everything and has such a high ceiling and i just like want to see him do well so badly and i think he is on his way for sure that's really hilarious that you mentioned rooting for him uh in particular because my wife is not very interested in sports in general so uh she used to go to games go to mizzou games and uh cardinal baseball games with me but i don't know she's just not as interested anymore and so i was just quizzing her like uh how many missouri basketball players can you name this year and she said not very many but i hear you yell yeah trey a lot (laughs) (laughs) so i guess that's a somebody that i you know am rooting for vocally in my living room as i sit on my couch uh, more than i realize he's making some threes the other night too yeah uh as a team against arkansas missouri shot 46 percent from two but just 19 percent from three but they made 34 out of 44 free throws and destroyed arkansas on the glass 52 to 35 Hmm. so a huge difference in that game um, in the rebounding margin. Um, Arkansas didn't shoot terribly, 44% from two, 21% from three, and they were 28 of 39 from the line. There were a total of 59 fouls called in this game. It was unreal. The game was so long. It was like a almost a three-hour game. Yeah. Overtime didn't help, but also True. just free throw after free throw. I mean, just... Well, you just, like that kind of thing, don't you? You're into that. Well... like. <laughs> I, all those fouls and free throws and well, stoppages of play. You know, that's that's a bit misleading. <laughs> I want fouls to be called, and I think defenses should have should be forced to play defense without fouling. But there was just a whistle. It was just kind of a guess so many times in the Arkansas game. A player would just drive, and it seemed like the refs were just blowing the whistle, and then we'll figure it out. There was, there's probably a foul, so we better blow the whistle every time. And for both sides, I mean, there was plenty of, there were plenty of times Missouri was going to the free throw line where I was like, there was not much contact there. And I think Penson does a pretty good job of when he gets in there. If he gets bumped at all, first of all, he usually is giving up some size to the person that bumps him. So it is going to, you know, dislodge him a little bit, but I think he sells it pretty well. And I don't know. I mean, just like with Arkansas, they were just kind of both teams were just driving to the basket with reckless abandon and just getting bailed out over and over again. Sometimes when there was hardly any contact, sometimes when there was a, just a completely clean block. Yeah. There would be a foul called. Yeah. What's their leading scorer? His name escapes me currently. Uh, Mason, Jones. Mason Jones. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, they talked about it several times on the broadcast, but 
I mean, he had like 30 points in like the last three games before the Mizzou game. And Mizzou held him in check. I mean, even in a game where they had so many, both teams had so many opportunities at the line. Uh, I mean, he's still, what, what did he end up with? 17. 17. I mean, it was 0 for 6 from 3. And I think, obviously, Missouri got a little bit lucky there. I mean, I don't think he's going to go 0 for 6 very often. And even, I'd love to say that Missouri played good defense, but, you know, it takes more than good defense for a pretty good shooter to go 0 for 6. You know, he had an off night, which Missouri completely took advantage of, and Mm -hmm. they had to. Yeah. So they got a little bit lucky there, but he's still 11 of 14 from the free throw line himself. Yeah. So he kind of figured out, you know, let's just, yeah, I think he and Pinson both were just like, all right, well, the way they're calling fouls, we're just going to put our head down and just for sure. Why not get to the rim? Yeah. All right. You make the call. It's Arkansas making the tournament at this point. I'd have to say no. They're like, they are just like the prototypical bubble team right now. They they've had some pretty high points in the season and right now they're in a pretty low rut at this point i'd say no however they have every opportunity to work themselves back onto the right side of the bubble they they play mississippi state tennessee and lsu at home still they play florida on the road so there's three home games right there against top 50-ish opponents. They win those. I think they could be in pretty good shape. Yeah, I think they will probably end up making the tournament as like a 10 or 11 seed. Um, okay, let me ask you this. How many SEC teams are going to make the tournament? I don't know. It seems like not very many. Um, well, LSU... LSU, Kentucky, Auburn. Those are There's three locks, yes. essentially. And then I after don't that, feel great about Florida. Do so you think Florida's a no? I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for this, Kyle. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I mean, I haven't really thought about it either. But I guess it's just off the top of my head, I think. I don't know. If I say yes to Florida, then I feel like I have to say yes to Mississippi State and potentially. No, there's no way South Carolina gets in. No way. No way. They lost to. 296 Stetson. They're playing pretty well right now. At home. And 267 Boston University at home. They have no... Their best win in the non-conference is Clemson and Virginia. ACC is not great this year. I think they will end up being a bubble team at the end of the year. I I agree with you. I mean, I don't know that they're going to make the tournament. They really don't... They've been playing really well the last month or so, but didn't do a whole lot before that. But I, I think they'll end up being on the bubble, but I don't know. The, the SEC is kind of weird. I think they could have four. They could have six. Like, it's just going to depend on what, like, Florida, Mississippi State, Arkansas, South Carolina, what those four teams do. Because I could see, really, any of those four making it or not making it. I wouldn't be shocked. All right, give me Kentucky, Auburn, LSU, Florida and Mississippi State. No Arkansas, no no South Carolina. No Tennessee. That's reasonable. And a lot of those are going to come down to head-to-head matchups. Yeah. Because there's each each of those teams have very winnable games, but uh that little group of four plays each other plenty here in the last yeah, month of the season, less than a month left. I'll say 6 get in and I'll take the exact same teams you just said plus Arkansas makes it. I kind of don't want Arkansas to make it, but that's just me being kind of salty. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, You ready to talk about this LSU game? Oh, absolutely. LSU beat Missouri 82 to 78, but just for a minute, let's talk about our awful predictions for these two games because, first of all, I predicted two wins against South Carolina and Texas A&M. And Missouri got completely blown out. They looked like they didn't even belong in the same gym as these teams. And then, obviously, they're going to lose pretty bad, most likely, to Arkansas and LSU. And they beat Arkansas and are should right have, th- should have yeah, beaten LSU. Are right there with LSU the entire time. I think they led for 35 minutes. 
so I what do you what do you even make of that like they're just you just give up because that's how this whole season has gone um, but I, I mean yeah it, I don't know what it is but maybe just something about playing a like middling SEC team on the road in the middle of the week like in South Carolina you're just kind of like I don't know like season's over like we don't these are the games that we should be trying to win like if we were on if we were a bubble team that maybe we'd be going hard for but since we kind of know our season's over we don't really care but we'd love to pull off a win against LSU in Arkansas yeah and especially the Arkansas game behind a big crowd and everything so I don't know Then you're feeling good going into LSU maybe you know they're not quite up for the yeah I I the crowd wasn't an issue no no I've actually been to an LSU game in baton rouge a couple of years ago and yeah it's kind of it's kind of like an old rickety old arena and shots fired like yeah it was kind of just like people don't care about basketball that much down there man i don't know it was like, it was like a yeah middle of february game that wasn't well attended it was against tennessee i think maybe a few years ago um it, it kind of seemed like a similar atmosphere at least from watching it on tv a few nights ago um, it looked like it maybe got a little louder at the end of the game, but maybe they're just quiet because they were getting smoked for most of the game. Yeah. But I, I would actually say that Missouri played well enough to win this game. I think they deserve to win. I think it's – we've gone this route. I've gone this route a few times in recent history where, you know, I kind of blame the refs, but I really do think that the refs kind of destroyed some momentum in this game and, and really, like – called this game unevenly um to a certain respect um just with and lsu just normally gets called for less fouls i think they're get called for the least amount of fouls in the sec potentially but just when i'm just watching this game i feel like there's a lot of contact both sides and there's way more fouls getting called in missouri and yeah lsu opponents shoot the fewest free throws per field goal attempt in the sec I, I mean, I just don't really know – watching that game, I don't really know why that needed to be that big of a discrepancy in fouls because it looked like it, it was played pretty similarly on both sides. Well, if I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit, then I would just say that that is who LSU is. They just don't send guy. they just do not put teams on the foul line. Mm-hmm. And Missouri is the opposite. They have a terrible habit, and now maybe – once we're this far into the conference season here, I'm walking back my devil's advocate position already. (laughs) Um, We're this far into the conference season. Maybe they have a little bit of a reputation, each team Mm -hmm. on the opposite extremes. So, you know, refs prepare for games, just like coaches and players do. They look at the teams and kind of their tendencies and things and know what to expect. And so to some extent, they're probably expecting Missouri to foul a lot and LSU to not foul very much. Yeah. So when that, if that starts to play out on the court, I think human nature would just allow the refs to kind of just go along with it. Yeah, Maybe. and a certain degree of it, I'm sure, like you said, we've seen enough data points in this season to know who fouls a lot. And Will Wade probably said, hey, go after this guy. He fouls a lot. And so I'm sure part of that's coaching. Part of that is LSU being more athletic probably. They can, you know, get up higher and you know block a shot without fouling probably easier than Missouri can or they can – you know, there's a lot of times where I'm watching Xavier Pinson just let a guy go right by him, and he tries to reach in because he got let the guy go right by him, and uh, that's a foul. Yeah, and I'm not really arguing necessarily that Missouri was called for too many fouls. I think it was more like I felt like Missouri was fouled and did not get called. Yeah, I think that's a legitimate complaint. Um, Missouri was seven of thirteen from the free throw line. LSU was twenty nine of thirty four. It was kind of like in the Arkansas game. At least they called it consistently. At least it was where even. like both teams yeah. were called like for probably way too many fouls, but at least they both had a lot of opportunities. And this game, it just didn't really feel that way. Yeah, LSU only attempted two more two point field goals than Missouri. So while Missouri did attempt more threes, there was, I mean, there was nothing from a game flow perspective that would lead you to believe that LSU deserved, or that Missouri deserved that many fewer free throw attempts yeah and i'm I'm certainly no expert but just in you know one live watch of you know watch through the game it just like it bugs me whenever 
you know, LSU's in the double bonus with 12 minutes left in the half, and Missouri has like, you know, and LSU has like three or four fouls called on yeah. them. It's just like there's just no way to me that this has been called correctly, that they've been – that they're – that foul discrepancies seven or eight fouls eight minutes into the game or into the half. What game was it? Uh, had to have been one of the losses last week where uh, Conzo Martin got teed up for – complaining about fouls i can't remember which game it was but i try to forget the last week's games but honestly there was a couple of those i didn't watch super closely he kind of looked like he reached his breaking point where it was like three or four possessions in a row missouri got called for really questionable you know not very much contact fouls and Mm -hmm. i think he just finally had enough and he got teed up for it and i thought it was a very justified complaint he needs to probably get teed up more often I think that probably is one of his only technical fouls in his entire yeah tenure like, at Missouri. Well, yeah, that may be. If that's if that's a second, then then it's definitely not more than two. Yeah. Uh, breaking down some individual performances in this one, uh, Drew Smith played hurt. Looked like pretty much all game. I saw on Twitter after the game that potentially he actually, uh, first rolled his ankle against West Virginia. Oh, it's really? It's been bothering him since then. Uh, but obviously it was bothering him, him in this game, but he still had 20 points, five rebounds, four assists, and twice he got into the lane, um, missed a shot, and as, and then put back his own miss for the basket. And I think both times he was like hobbling on and barely one foot even the jumped. whole time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was absolutely phenomenal in this game and really probably one of the best performances of anybody all year. And especially given his condition with, you know, barely being able to run around yeah, the court. I was saying to you, like, we may, they may need to get him out of there. Cause they if probably should have. If he's going to, like, really. A- and since this has been a nagging thing, I'm sure they've gone through the steps to make sure this isn't something that he could really, you know, damage and have to have surgery and be out an extended period. But it still just makes you wonder, like, should he be really out there playing? He looked like he was in a ton of pain especially the second half. I mean, at times he looked like he could barely walk. <laughs> and then the next possession, he'd just do something that was like, how, how are you doing this right now? I mean, he was putting together a, a, an incredible for- performance for somebody that was completely healthy. Right. And I saw this on Twitter, but I didn't hear it in the broadcast or anything. But somebody said that Andy Kennedy said that Conzo said, you follow me? I fo- I'm following. That Drew Smith's ankle was potentially a worse injury than what was keeping Mark Smith and Jeremiah Tillman out. Do you say it on the broadcast? Or you said you saw it on I Twitter? I saw on Twitter that Andy Kennedy said that on the broadcast, oh, okay. referring to a conversation he had with Conzo Martin. So now I'm telling it to you as like fourth or fifth hand information. That's interesting. If, if that, I missed that. If that really happened, that's interesting that he said if that publicly. If I really saw that on Twitter? No, that, that Andy Kennedy would have said that publicly. Yeah on the on television because that kind of is a shot at mark smith and tillman for like maybe being out when they probably shouldn't be they've maybe given up on the season or whatever yeah that's just makes you think makes you makes you makes you wonder a little bit uh besides drew smith um reed nico again in double figures javon pickett as well as mitchell smith uh they were able to splash home a few threes as well Penson, like we said earlier, 0 for 5 from 3. We still had 9 points, 6 rebounds, 7 assists, and my favorite stat, just one turnover. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're making a lot of a lot of threes in the first half, especially. Uh, I think I let out a couple let's go. Oh, yeah. That, you know things are good when oh, I'm yeah. saying that. So it's like my, my classic go-to line mm-hmm. when things are good. Mine apparently is, yeah, Trey. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, speaking of that shooting, though, the team uh, known as Missouri Tigers shot – 56% from two, 43% from three. Now, a lot of that has to do with the fact that LSU is not really known for their defense. They give up 99 points to Vanderbilt, after all. But at least Missouri showed if they play a lackluster defense, they can still occasionally make some baskets. Yeah, on the road, too. Yeah. Yeah, I if, if you were surprised by the Arkansas win, I mean, this one was infinitely even more surprising to me that they played well. Uh, rebounding was pretty even in this one. Missouri did have four more turnovers than LSU. And still, I see Missouri a lot of unforced turnovers. You know, twice, I think Kobe Brown was stepping out of bounds when he caught a pass. 
That's frustrating. And one of them, as the whistle was blowing for the out-of-bounds, Torrance Watson sank a three-pointer. Yeah. And so that's always disheartening. Um, uh, we talked about what the real difference in this game was, though, was the free throws. And I would also add in Xavier Pinson being 0 for 5 from 3. You hate mm-hmm. to put it all on one guy like that, but, man, if he just knocks down a couple of those, yeah, then it's Also, Will Wade story. was paying the refs. Yeah, well, I, obviously. I read on Twitter that Andy Kennedy was having a conversation, potentially, on the television broadcast yeah. that Will Wade was paying the refs, and I can't believe he's a coach still. Wow. Man. None of that happened, but I <laughs> still is true that I can't believe he's a coach. Yeah. To think back and think, you know, I was really high on Will Wade as the coach at, at Missouri at one point. I wanted him in Columbia. Okay, okay. Yeah, gotcha. And looking back on it now, I'm just like, what did I ever see in this guy? I mean, just watching him on the sideline in the huddle, he was mic'd up part of the time or just like Ugh. come on guys play Ugh. harder he's just he's wagging that finger Ugh. yeah man i just he's just i got that shirt that's too big like a little <laughs> bit untucked just would you say okay if if we had a hate list as <laughs> a po- as a podcast Oof. where would he fall on like would it be top five i think yeah easily okay We'll like as to, we'll as a to, singular person, yeah. Okay, yeah. We'll have to come up with that list sometime. Uh, I agree. Maybe we'll we'll put a we'll put a board like a whiteboard up here. So yeah. You, yeah Hang a whiteboard on a curtain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll figure it out. I know what you meant. <laughs> we can, uh, that way, everybody knows exactly where they stand. Right. According to the Missouri Sports Podcast, but yeah, Will Wade just. I can't stand him. What a scumbag, man! So glad he's not anywhere near the Missouri basketball program, even though. We may have like gone to a final four or something. <laughs> and of course, if he was in Columbia, I'd probably love him and defend him to my death. So Yeah. I was like looking around the crowd. I was like, look at all these idiots, like <laughs> cheering on this, like a bunch of, bunch of cheaters, yeah. like literally proven cheaters. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, it'd probably be me. <laughs> <laughs> he was yeah, the coach I, at <laughs> I was mad that they were cheering like, because they, this wasn't even supposed to be a close game. I was just like, stop cheering. You were supposed to win this all along. Like quit getting excited. This wasn't even supposed to be a close game. Ugh. I, w- I was salty during this. And and I wish, honestly, I, I regret rooting for LSU to win the college football championship at this point. Wow. I rooted for him. You know, Coach O. You know, I thought I, I, thought I knew a guy. But <laughs> here he Coach is. Coach Odom? Coach Ordron. <laughs> you oh. think you know a guy, and then he just goes and is friends with Will Wade, probably, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, probably. Oh, you think you know a guy? I forgot to mention this in the Arkansas game, but did yeah. you see the tweet? I should have remembered who it was, but somebody tweeted that in the Arkansas game, Jimmy Witt like either made a basket or something, I and think, it was like I think he got a rebound. Yeah, some something. he did yeah. something, and he said like "This is my city" or yeah. something like that. It's like, like okay. get all the way out of here, yeah. man! Like, like you could have played. You are here. so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and then they lost. Put him so. on the list. Jimmy Witt, yeah, he's probably top 12 or so on my hate <laughs> list. I just moved him up about 30 spots since last week. Yeah. Yeah, that's a little here. silly considering uh, he had every opportunity to play. He's played at Arkansas two different times. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. Yeah, what do you like about Arkansas? So, what, 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 he just keeps like, ah, right, man, I just I already transferred away from Arkansas, but I just have to go back yeah, for another so year. so nice. Got to get back there. All right. Anything else you want to talk about about this LSU game? I don't know. Probably not. We're getting a little complainy. Well, got got to do it every <laughs> once in a while. Uh, Missouri is now eleven and thirteen, three and eight in the SEC, one hundred fifteenth in Kim Palm, one hundred sixty third on offense, ninety first on defense. In SEC play, they are thirteenth on offense, eleventh on defense, and pretty much their only strengths at all are their free throw percentage on offense and their ability to force turnovers on defense. And have good press conferences. Yeah, that, I mean. Number one in the nation. I mean, potentially. <laughs> and it sucks me in every time. I'm like, oh, yeah, this like, is my guy. Like, I'm about to, like, personally reach out to every recruit and be like, have yes. you seen this video? I just. Like, show this to your parents. Conzo forever. Yeah. Man. 
impressive stuff. guy. Yes. Um, nice if we could win a game. That'd be that'd be pretty cool. Uh, Missouri goes up against Auburn next in Columbia, so it's a home game. Tigers v Tigers. It's a pretty common matchup in the SEC. Auburn is twenty-two and two on the season, nine and two in conference play, thirty-two in Ken Palm, twenty-eighth on offense, fifty-sixth on defense. They have. 13 top 100 wins, including LSU, Kentucky, and Alabama. But they did also lose to Alabama and Florida on the road. And it should be noted that their Arkansas and LSU wins were in overtime. And then a a road win against Ole Miss was a double overtime win. So they've had some close calls. They could easily be, you know, they could easily have seven losses yeah they really have had some close calls recently too i think they had a home game against lsu recently and i th- think they had like a double digit deficit in that game and ended up coming back and winning by one point on like a buzzer beating shot i think that was uh, the overtime game yeah yeah oh it went to overtime yeah. okay yeah i think you're they right. had they had back to back they had three overtime games in a row wow at arkansas home against lsu home against alabama and two games before that Double overtime against Ole Miss. My goodness. Well, I think it's about time that they lose. In triple overtime. <laughs> well, we'll see when we get to your predictions. Um, for those that don't know, Bruce Pearl is the head coach in Auburn after a long time at Tennessee and then a brief stint where he was out of coaching because he was a cheater. He was caught cheating and wasn't allowed to coach. Sounds familiar. Well. I wish. <laughs> yeah. Will Wade's still allowed to coach. Get out of here. Uh Last year, he took them to the Final Four. So, all is well. Cheaters are good at coaching. Cheaters prosper always. I think that's how the saying goes. Pretty much. Yeah, Uh, it's kind of unbelievable how good Auburn is this year, considering we're probably about to talk about this, but but what they've lost from last year's team. They were fantastic last year. Yeah. Final Four team, which is not probably what you think of historically for Auburn basketball team that Missouri beat in the opening round of the SEC tournament just like two years prior yeah and they lost an unbelievable amount of talent and somehow they're still like a top 10 team in the country maybe better than that they're it's honestly unbelievable how good they are yeah they lost uh Jarrett Harper and Bryce Brown who was they they were basically they were one of the best backcourt duos in the country last year arguably the best they brought back Samir Doughty, Austin Wiley, and then they brought in one of our favorite players. Uh, if you look at a list of non-Mizzou players who we talk about the most on the Missouri Sports Pro- Podcast, Isaac Okoro is on that list because he was in the Bass Pro Tournament of Champions, and we got to see him up close and personal, and he's really, really good. He's probably going to be a NBA lottery pick. So they brought back key contributors, They reloaded with some key freshmen, and this year, Dowdy averages 16 points per game. Uh, Austin Wiley is almost averaging a double-double, 10 points, 9 rebounds, and Isaac Okoro adds another 13 points per game. And in the SEC, in SEC play, though, I mean, it shows with their, they have two losses, both in SEC play and those really close games that we already talked about. They're only fifth in offensive efficiency and eighth in defensive efficiency, so not numbers that you would you know just think you know they're a necessarily a contender for the title Mm -hmm. but still really good we've seen a lot of times in college athletics where teams get very highly uh, rated recruits and still not really hit on some of those guys but I would say Isaac Okoro is a perfect example of a guy they really hit on (laughs) I mean a five-star player and it seems like in basketball the rate the recruiting rankings are typically more accurate especially their freshman year yeah football and, and can especially be for the top of the list yeah the top of each recruiting class there's hardly any just guys that just don't pan out at all true uh but they have really needed him to come in and play meaningful minutes and he has definitely surpassed that and probably at the expectations they had for him and they, he's been amazing yeah not shooting very well from three um, and in fact, that's probably one of the main weaknesses for Auburn as a, as a team is they don't shoot it well 
uh, from three. Which is weird because it's what they did so well last year. Yeah. When you think of, at least when I think of them being so good, I think of them being like just super quick, really good shooting team. Yeah. But like, that's not really who they are. Too many, too many excellent offensive threats to control them all at once. Mm-hmm. And they've got a little bit of that this year, just not as consistent. And they're just not as efficient on offense as they were. But one of the guys that is incredibly efficient and I think is going to be the downfall of the Missouri Tigers is Austin Wiley and his ability to get to the free throw line. He is third in the nation at fouls drawn per 40 minutes played. And he shoots just, he could shoot better. He shoots just under 70% from the free throw line. But, I mean, it's not uncommon for him to shoot double digit free throws by himself. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that seems like the likely scenario of the recipe for a disaster because we know Missouri's foul tr- uh, issues. So, even if he's not making a ton of free throws, if he's getting Reed Nico in foul trouble, getting Mitchell Smith in foul trouble, it's where we have to bring in Parker Brown again then. Which Parker Brown played decent minutes yeah. whenever he came in against LSU. I mean, it's not like he's he terrible, only logged but. three according to the uh, box score, but I think he, I think he had a basket. Yeah, he did. Yeah. But Missouri being kind of thin on the front line, Austin Wiley will likely take advantage of that. He's just pretty efficient scorer down low. He's a tremendous rebounder, tremendous shot blocker. Just doesn't sound like a good, uh, good thing for Missouri to be facing considering they seems like at times they might enjoy getting the shot blocked. They do it so often. <laughs> um, other than that though, I am just excited to watch Isaac Okoro play. Is he hurt a little you bit? Know what? I don't think he is going to play. I think you're right. Uh, he had, he underwent some tests and they determined there was no structural damage. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, Isaac Okoro, you mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, one hour ago, here's an update on injured Auburn basketball star. He's got a hamstring pull and didn't practice today. It's definitely too early to know how long he'll be out, hmm. according to Bruce Pearl. Well, that doesn't sound great for his chances of playing on Saturday. No. Well, that might help. Missouri's chances, it's a little bit disappointing that we're not going to see maybe one of the better players in the SEC, definitely as far as freshmen go. Mm -hmm. You think he's going to the NBA after this season? I think so. I think even though, I mean, the NBA has proven basically that you can take any player and they can develop their three-point shot to where it's serviceable for NBA standards. It really is amazing how well they shoot. When that doesn't happen, it's news. Like the fact that Ben Simmons hasn't figured it out yet. (laughs) I mean, he's in year four, so... It's just like an internet meme at this point. Yeah, but I mean, even you think about going way back now. I'm showing my age because I'm saying way back and I'm talking about Jason Kidd, but uh, <laughs> he was known as Asen because he didn't have a J until like 10 years into his career, and then he became a super efficient three-point shooter. So I think it can happen to anybody. So when you have a guy like Okoro who's just prototypical like three and d size and has the defense has the rebounding ability has the the strength every nba team would say yeah sign me up for that we'll teach him how to shoot threes sure so for that reason i think he will be a lottery pick sounds good what do you think about this game i think missouri's got a shot Uh, what what makes you think that? I promise I'm not on drugs or anything like that. Uh, just excited about my Mizzou Tigers. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't think that they're going to win the game or anything like that, but I, I think they've shown weaknesses. I think they've shown the blueprint for how teams can beat them. Uh, they like I mean, well, we just talked about it. Teams are getting close. And somebody's going to knock them off at some point. Um, it's going to happen. And Missouri plays well at home. There, I, I would kind of like to to know how healthy Drew Smith is if he's still hobbling around and there's still no Tillman or no Mark Smith. Well, I mean, he hobbled his way right. I mean, I guess, LSU but that's, I mean, at some point you got to think he's just going to be like, okay, I'm done with this. Yeah. Um, but uh, or the Auburn's going to take advantage of the fact that he can't run very fast. You know, somebody's going to figure that out. But um, 
I don't know. I th- I just think that Missouri, I, whenever they have a reason to play hard, and they do, and at, at home, and I, I, if it's against a opponent they respect and and want to play against, it seems like they play hard and play well. So, I think this game will be close to the end, um, and I think Auburn will. <laughs> you gonna pick a predict a fourth overtime game in a row for Auburn? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's gonna overtime, but I think Auburn is going to win seventy five to 68 and they'll pull away in the last five in the last four or five minutes i think auburn does a few things that scare me first of all they're first in the sec at uh getting to the free throw line that doesn't bode well for missouri however they're only 11th in effective field goal percentage so kind of one of these teams that we've talked about among others in the sec that can just go kind of cold for a little while and their only offense auburn is going to have moments especially on the road where their only offense is free throws for an extended period of time so it really comes down to can missouri capitalize on those and make some timely shots and hopefully get to the line themselves um I just don't feel like Missouri can have three solid performances against top tier or like middle of the road or better SEC te- SEC teams. Three in a row just seems unlikely to me. I'm going to say Auburn wins 80 to 67. Yeah, I mean, I'm not at this point. Nothing surprises me against any team, really, just because of the scope of things Missouri has done, good and bad, this year. So yeah, if they just get blown out by like twenty, twenty-five, like I'm just gonna be like, okay, well, not surprised. If they somehow manage to win this game, I'm gonna be surprised, but I'm not gonna be like shocked, like just because I think Auburn's beatable and. Weird, well, pretty much everybody, weird things have happened in college basketball this year. Yeah, everybody in the SEC is incredibly beatable. Yeah. I mean, like when I fill out my bracket, I can't imagine having an SEC team go very far at all. Probably not. Like, depending on the matchups. And well, circling back to being salty about LSU, I hope they get matched up against some like run and gun, hot shooting three pointer, three point shooting team in the NCAA tournament and they give up like. 100 points and just get bounced in the first round i rarely root against other sec teams in you know college football playoff ncaa tournament but man i would just i'd love to see lsu just get run out of the gym you just had enough of will wade and skylar mays and crew huh i actually really like skylar mays which is unfortunate they seem I like know. Uh, the team actually seems like they've got some solid guys that yeah i kind of like, love to have on your team i kind of like him but man he kills us every time we play him yeah. it's like he makes everything uh let's see here anything else about this auburn game nope well then what if i told you there's a winnable game on the horizon of course now it seems like any game is winnable but also any game they could lose by 20 Uh, but they stay at home and play ole miss ole miss is 13 and 11 4 and 7 in the sec 87th in kimpom 149th on offense 64th on defense so basically very similar to missouri in those rankings just a little bit better in both uh this is their second year under coach kermit davis and he did take them to the ncaa tournament last year and it's kind of surprising when you just look at the roster that they're not very good this year they uh they lost terrence davis to graduation he was a good shooter and excellent defender uh, but they brought back Brian Tyree, Devontae Schuler, and Blake Henson, like the the core from last year outside of Davis. Uh, but basically, all three of them have been less efficient and basically less efficient in every way. Worse free throw shooting numbers, worse three point shooting numbers. Henson, worse two point shooting numbers. So it happens to other teams too? Yeah. Regression all around for Ole Miss. 
I do think that Brian Tyree is probably one of the best scorers in the SEC. Especially when he gets going, man, he can really make shots. So that's the difference, I think, between Ole Miss's regression and Missouri's is we still have not seen – I mean, you look at the Florida game, I guess, as a, as a game where it all comes together for Missouri. But Ole Miss has guys that are good enough on their own – to fill it up and put the team on their back. Yes. Just be the offense. Yeah. And a lot of it is from their shooting, like shooting from deep. Yeah. All three of these guys, Blake Henson, not quite as much. He can take over a game in his own way, but um, Tyree and Schuler at any moment could just get hot and take over the game. And they have been the last week or two. They've played really well. Yeah. I think, I don't know ex- exact numbers, but I, I feel like Tyree's put up, a couple of like 30 maybe even 40 point performances in the last week or two he put up 40 against mississippi state and 38 against south carolina two of their last three games my goodness yeah he's he's hot right now he's dangerous i remember definitely remember him from last year he, he was killing us yeah um if you're looking for some good news they do not get to the line very much in sec play and they struggle to finish inside. They are the only team worse at two-point uh, conversions is your Missouri Tigers. That doesn't surprise me at all. No. I, I personally feel like they're better than 150th on offense. And obviously, this is a season-long data set. Yeah. But and, and I'm probably like being dramatic about how well they've, how well they've played on offense the last couple weeks. So they're probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, they're probably well, they won three in a row: South Carolina, Florida, and Mississippi State. Those are three really solid wins. And, yeah, you know they they played really well uh, in two of those games. They scored more than eighty, and then Florida. I mean, teams don't typically score that much against Florida, but they still put up sixty-eight. Yeah, I mean, if, if they're still on like they've been, I just don't see any way Missouri wins this game. Honestly, I, I just this feels like a team that has just so much firepower, and it's kind of like that Alabama game where even Missouri plays well. Um, it just, I'm not sure that I can respect their chances of winning because it just doesn't matter because Alabama is going to come back or not Alabama, but like Alabama, Ole Miss is just going to, you know, they're not going to be cold long enough to be out of the game, come back and answer every single yeah. time. Yeah. And when you look at Ole Miss's defense and sec play, they're ranked second in defensive efficiency. Mm-hmm. So they're kind of putting it together at the right time. Yeah. It's like their offense is what scares me. But really, when you look at the data for the whole season, their defense has been even better. Yeah, it's, it's weird that they, they had this stretch from January 4th to basically the whole month of January. They won one game against Georgia. They started SEC play 0-5. Has Tyree been hurt a little bit? I f- might be imagining that, but I feel like maybe he hasn't played as well. Uh, he missed one game this year. Okay. Uh, but other than that, a ton of minutes. Okay. So it doesn't look like it's affected his minutes too much. I think this is going to be another tough one, man. Uh, we play at Ole Miss in a few weeks where I, I think that's a certain loss. Um, but, uh, you know, Missouri probably should win this game. But just I don't know what to expect at this point. So I think Missouri could take advantage of Ole Miss's propensity to foul and send teams to the free throw line. So it'd be really cool to see <laughs> Missouri be on the other end of that for a game. Um, man, I told myself after last week I was not going to predict any more wins. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe just... Well, things are a lot different yeah. right now than they were this time last week. Well, I kind of just want to let the let the reverse jinx do its thing. So I think, uh, I think Ole Miss wins... Maybe they're not too terribly hot playing away. Those last three wins that they have were all at home. Um, I'm going to say they have an off night shooting and only make like four three-pointers in the game. Missouri does a pretty good job on their interior defense. And Missouri, oh my gosh, I want to predict the win. We allow it. I don't want to reverse jinx them. Producer Cameron says it's okay. In fact, he's encouraging you to do it. All right. Missouri, 65-63. I like it. I'll predict the loss. 78-74, <laughs> to 74, Ole Miss. 
7874. Well, I should have reverse jinxed him, but now it's on you. You got to reverse jinx him. One of us is going to be right. Yep. Uh, I just feel like they got to pull through, pull, they got to pull out some of these home games. You know, they already missed their chance with some of the other lower tier SEC teams. I think that's kind of why I just don't feel that great about this game is because it's like there's been a lot of these like toss up games at home where it's like, well, you got to win this. Like Tennessee was uh, definitely an example that sticks out. And, you know, there's, it feels like there's been a couple of those games and yeah, home against Texas A&M, the, the games it's like where it's just like, that. yeah, like the games where it's like they have to win this or they should absolutely win this. They don't show up. So it just seems like this is another one of those games where it's like, well, they should probably win this, but they aren't. Yeah, that's not really any like great analysis or anything. That's just an incredibly like general like <laughs> speculative statement. But I mean, they just they just need shots to fall. Will it happen? I guess they got a decent chance at home, but now Ole Miss has a pretty good defense. Now that is good analysis. Yeah, they need the shots to go in. That's what Conzo but, said was the big difference. You know, lately is making shots. I would never try to argue against that. We got anything else uh, for the folks? We're we're both predicting losses to Auburn. I say they pull it out, pull out a win against Ole Miss. You say nah. I think that's all we got for the folks. All right, all right, everyone. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. And, and you, you got it. YouTube. YouTube. And Gotta we're on Twitter. Thumbnail. Yeah, that's the thumbnail right there. We're on Twitter. At Missouri Sports Pod, and you can email us at Missouri Sports Pod at gmail.com, and you can find us on Instagram as well. Producer Cameron is just gonna scour the video to find the most like embarrassing look uh, for both of us and use that as the thumbnail. And I approve of that, honestly. Yeah, I'm, go for the I'm happy with it. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at C underscore Albert08. Thank you everyone for listening. We will see you next week. Mm-hmm.